are here with Supervisor Don Kanabi. Don, you will be honored as Citizen of the Year at the Terranea Resort next month, and you'll be leaving us, and we kind of wanted to talk a little bit about your career. 35 years in public service, 20 years here at District 4. Um, did you ever see yourself working in public service for this many years? Absolutely not. I mean, everything that's uh, happened to me along the line is, I call them like God things, you know, the little things that have happened that... When I originally went to work for Dean Dana back in 1982, I was on the street of city council. Um, he asked me to come aboard to help him out with some of his cities because I knew a lot of the, the electeds. And uh, he asked me to help him out for 90 days. And here we are almost 35 years later. So I wound up 14 years as Dean's chief of staff and then ran for the office myself uh, with his support and uh, won that election in 1996. And so, you know, uh, I don't think that I ever um, ever thought of myself in public life. That was not something that I either aspired. I mean, I wish I could say, you know, I dreamed of this, you know right. I mean? I mean, I'm just a kid from Rock Island, Illinois, right? And you know, on the Mississippi River back there. And I tell the story that about politics and my first foray was running for class president after being on student council, being involved. The Friday night before the election, the guy I was running against uh, caught a touchdown pass with no time left on the clock. The election was Monday, so I think I got two votes, mine and my girlfriend's, but I wasn't sure about my girlfriend's. And so, I mean, a again, I mean, you know, uh, and then my parents moving to California be while I was still in college and leaving and forwarding address that I could find. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, so I got here in sort of a unique way right. and spent my time in the military. And, and uh, you know, I mean, the rest is just sort of piecemeal. I mean, I, I again, I can't say that wow, this has been a dream. And, but I will tell you, um, I feel really blessed. It's been a great journey and probably the best political job in America. You know, you've had so many cities to take care of over the years, but you always, always have made it a point to come to RPV, uh, the chamber breakfast, to really mix around with the people. Why was it important to you to take care of an affluent community? Well, I think, you know, in the early days, one of the things I wanted to make sure that they understood that I cared about them just as much as Dean Dana did. And, yeah. you know, Dean lived on the hill, and obviously I didn't. I'm down in the flatlands. <laughs> I say I live on the water. I back up the flood control channel. But, uh, uh, no, I, I, you know, one of the things, my background in local government, being a mayor and a member of a city council, mm -hmm. really played an important role in my representation of my district. And uh, whether it's a poor community or a fluent community, at the end of the day, uh, their needs are all the same, some in different areas uh, in working together. And so I, you know, the hills are a very, very important part of the district, and as well as Long Beach, as well as Diamond Bar, as well as the unincorporated areas of Roland Heights or Hacienda Heights. So I tried to treat everyone equally. Uh, most importantly, uh, I really worked hard to make sure that they got their fair share of the tax dollars that they paid. I mean, they paid taxes just like everybody else. And exactly. I remind everyone there are 87 other cities in the county besides the city of L.A. You know, you and I have had many, many conversations about the Chamber of Commerce in Rancho Palos Verdes, and you always compliment them what a great job they do. Why is it important for a city to have a chamber like that? Well, I think it's very important. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm a chamber president husband. You know, my wife was president twice of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce and a small business person. I think the chamber plays a very, very important role in networking, uh, bringing the business to, to the forefront to share what they have. You know, you know, when you walk the street, if you live in a city, okay, as an example, and you don't get a chance to walk around and see every business, but if you have a chamber of commerce sort of tooting your horn, uh, it really helps the, the, the vibrancy of the business community. More importantly, there's other opportunities, whether it's purchasing, whether it's newsletters, whatever it may be, insurance opportunities, uh, seminars on different things that are affecting business with the, the changing laws each and every year. Uh, the chamber plays a very, very important role and, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the life of a city. And for people that don't know, you're, you're there at the street fairs. You come for some of the fun events and mix with people. Why? I just enjoy people. I mean, number one, I'm sort of a people person, I think, and uh, I've always enjoyed that. You know, this job is um, very, um, how do I want to say it, very intense mm -hmm. uh, in the things that we have to deal with uh, as it relates to the safety net. And, and so a lot of people may see me presenting scrolls. It's so much more than that. And so, you know, it, it's really important for me to, to be able to feel feel a community, to see what they're, they're like on a community-based group, you know, organization, party, whatever it may be, street fairs, 
uh, seeing the people sort of move around and operate and just to get to know your community. I mean, it's, it's, it's no different than, you know, me, me, me doing my job. I mean, I want to know what's going on in the life of my community. I want to know when I stand up in front of a group, whether it's the chamber, whether it's a community-based group, I want to know what's going on in the community. And you can only find that out by trying to be a part of it a little bit. I mean, obviously with 2 million people in 20, 27 cities, it's tough to get, you know, as around as much as you want. But I think I've really worked hard over the years to, to be, to feel like I'm a part of their community. You know, you've been involved in so many charities and organizations like Rancho, uh, sex trafficking, uh, and the Safe Surrender Program. Tell us a little bit, just briefly, about each one, um, and will you still stay involved with them? Oh, absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, on the sex trafficking issue, um, I'm still in contact with the federal government. I may be involved on a federal level uh, doing some things with that. Um, as it relates, I sort of go back, we're going one at a time. Uh, Rancho is a perfect example. Rancho Los Amigos Rehabilitation Hospital, um, one of the premier rehabilitation hospitals in America, and the only really in the top 20, 25 of public hospitals. I mean, the rest are all private. And my involvement in Rancho, again, it, it, it's sort of an interesting start. It had nothing to do with the county. Um, at the time, I was on the city council in the city of Cerritos. Mm -hmm. I had just been elected, and we went to contract cities for our annual contract cities convention. And we had our city dinner at the top of the mountain there at the trolley or whatever they call it. And we came back down the hill and we were coming back. I had the fire chief as an example in the back of my car, my wife and I and the fire chief of the county of Los Angeles. And we came around a corner and one of my colleagues' cars was off to the side. It looked fine. Well, when I went there to see if he was okay, he wasn't. Uh, and so obviously with the fire chief, we were able to get him treatment and get him to the hospital. When I left him that night, and they told me he had broken ribs. Uh, next morning at 6 o'clock, I found out that he was paralyzed for the rest of his life. And so uh, I tried to assist him once he got done with the treatment to stabilize him. And down in Palm Springs, he needed a place to go. And uh, they picked Rancho, and they sent him to Rancho. And so at the time, I was a stockbroker. So the market closes every day in California at 1 o'clock. I'd go over and be, spend the afternoons with him, every day almost. And uh, I was with him the first time he sat up in his bed, the first time he had a transfer from his bed to his chair, from his chair to his car, to home, whatever it may be. I was with him with all those first, and uh, stuck him in a beer or a hamburger every once in a while uh, to add some. But I became very familiar with Rancho and uh, the miracles that they performed there and the, the, the difficulties as a patient, the difficulties as somebody in occupational recreational therapy, uh, the things that they have to do with the discipline. And so I, you know, I was a member of the Sridis Optimus Club, which is like a Kiwanis or Rotary Club. And I used to go up on Thursday nights uh, with the Downey Optimus Club and uh, fix hot dogs during the summer for the patients. Now, again, it had nothing to do with the county. I was a stockbroker. Uh, and then fast forward, I wind up here. And I wind up with Dean, and then I wind up, you know, there was redistricting. We wind up with Rancho in our district. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's really been a passion of mine um, to make sure that they have the resources they need and we're rebuilding, we call it Rancho Rising 2020, a new wellness center, a new second wing of the outpatient clinic because there's two things happening to Rancho, obviously the ongoing need and we've done a contract with the VA for the rehab of, of veterans coming back from IED kinds of things, brain trauma. And then also, uh, many people don't know, but Rancho originally uh, was a polio farm. Uh, and part of the county system, but a polio farm. And so there's a post-polio syndrome happening right now, which has really put a burden on our outpatient services out there. Patients that had polio that have been okay are starting to have some problems with a whole new unique treatment. And so we're trying to deal with that and, and make the facilities is, is good for that as well. So it's just been this process, and I've been in this position, never ever thinking that I would be in this position to help Rancho. And um, you know, I've started art programs and... Uh, you know, we have all different kinds of programs out there and, and pieces of equipment that allow some folks to walk if they can. Yep. Uh, so, you know, it's just it's just amazing facility. And, yes, I will stay involved with Rancho. Uh, the other piece, um, the sex trafficking is an example. That came to my attention several years ago by a couple, I call them my sheroes, a couple of my probation officers uh, uh, that are women in our probation department telling me about this issue of sex trafficking. And I said, well, how did you guys do? You travel all over the world or what? You know, thinking it was in Thailand or some other place. He said, no, right here in your own backyard. And this is about four or five years ago. 
So because of their leadership and what they've done, they got me involved, and I've sort of been on the forefront of that issue. Uh, my colleagues have been very supportive and also got involved in many different ways. We've created protocols uh, as it relates because there's no such thing as a child prostitute. I mean, they are victims. They are victims. Uh, and so we're working through all that, you know, try to treat them as such. We have dedicated courtrooms so they don't have to go back out with a scumbag pimp. Uh, we're doing a lot of different things. We've trained, we're training all our metro employees because public transportation uh, is a, a, a very important part of moving these young victims around. Uh, we're training, you know, lawyers. We're training ER folks. We're training courtroom folks, you know, to be able to help identify uh, these victims and get them the treatment or at least the opportunity. To, to get out of that system. And, and it's bigger than ever because the gangs are getting into it. Right. It's, it's easier to you know, turn a, a young victim six, eight, ten times a night than it is to sell one bullet or, or you know, buy a, a one, one drug or something like that. So it's a big issue and we're working with them. We're trying to get our arms around it. And we're probably the leaders in the country in what we've been able to do. I've been trying to raise it to a federal level, which we've been able to do. I testified in front of the Foreign Affairs Committee on this issue. So it's something, again, inside the county of Los Angeles, you know, it's a safety net. We do so much and so many different things that right. people don't realize. And yet you still have these, you know, always the front page stories or the connect the dot reporters. I mean, you have these incredible people like these two probation officers that take it on themselves originally outside their, the network of their job to, to, to be involved. I mean, I've been at fundraisers trying to assist them. I have a member of my own staff, he and his wife do yoga inside the juvie halls uh, to deal with some of these victims. But I was at a fundraiser one night for that and one of the probation officers got paged and it was a 10 year old girl picked up right down here in Main Street. Uh, so it, it's an issue that we're trying to deal with and we've been very successful. I've got a lot of bipartisan support in Sacramento on pieces of legislation to change how we look at these things and we're moving them forward on a national level. And nobody thinks about that happening here, of course. No, absolutely. Everybody else like myself, until it was brought to my attention, it's in right. some third world country. Mm -hmm, of course. And then the last one, the Safe Surrender Program, that was, that's been around since 2001. And again, uh, an issue that, you know, one morning you read the paper and baby Andrew was thrown in a dumpster. Yeah. And so I asked my staff to see what they could do. I, know, I knew that probably as a county we couldn't do much, but we had to have some legislative help. Well, uh, as we all know, each year, two, three, four thousand bills come in and out of the legislature. We found a bill that had been passed and signed by the governor a year before called the Safe Surrender Program, but no one knew anything about it. So we went to work. I, I put a committee together, probably 30, 40 people. We had, a, we had a hotline set up within 30 days of 128 different languages. And then we just kept expanding the program to where, you know, we've saved 146 lives. And... Uh, it's been an incredible experience. I've been able to share in birthdays uh, of these young kids, to see them with their siblings, their families. We've done, you know, barbecues and, you know, those kinds of things. We have a, right down here at the Hall of Administration, we now have a Garden of Life where we brought in the families and the kids and they were able to plant their, you know, their, their little trees and the little bushes and things like that. So, it, it, you know, if, if I have a legacy, I hope that's it. Uh, it's well in place, too, that... Uh, you don't need Don Kanabi to run it. It's going to run on its own. And uh, now I'm, I've set up a scholarship fund. We've been raising money for that. We've been very successful. So, I mean, you stop and think, 2001, these kids are going to be ready to go to college, some of them. So we're working hard on that. And, uh, again, it's just been one of those programs that, you know, I've never seen government work better or faster than what we did in the Safe Surrender Program, billboards public service and I mean we've done everything in multiple languages and we've had a lot of support uh, to make it happen you know everyone's on board now every not only county hospitals but every hospital in the county because it's hard to imagine that someone could be so desperate that they don't have a family friend or someone to to do the kinds of things you know to talk to and so these poor ladies um, and we've had 146 brave moms do the right thing right. You know, they get pregnant in secret, they want to hide the secret, then they want to throw away the secret. But now, no name, no shame, no blame. You know, you are so loved by so many people, and you have brought so much of yourself into this job. You're not the typical politician that we see out there. How have you been able to do that? Well, I mean, I hope I've been able to, um, as I tell folks, you know, just never forget where you come from. 
Um, my upbringing was in the Midwest. Uh, that's not a bad place to, to grow up. Uh, not near the peer pressures that I see my kids go through and my grandkids now. Um, and so I really, you know, that's just my nature. I mean, I've always been, uh, you can call me a joiner or whatever, but I mean, I've always been involved in my church groups, in my community. Um, and it's just been a, a part of my life. But again, <laughs> never ever thinking of the political life. So I've made the transition, hopefully in the right way, but more importantly, uh, I also know that, you know, you know, today's success is tomorrow's failure and you meet the same people going up, you do coming down kind of a thing. Um, and I just, you know, it, it's my nature. And I mean, it's, you know, been able to maintain my composure and not think of myself any more important than I am. And to remember those young victims, to remember the babies, to remember the patients at Rancho. And on top of most importantly, when you represent 2 million people and 27 cities, you have to put together an incredible staff. And that's what I've been able to do. I mean, they're my eyes and ears and because there's no physically no way possible for me to do all that. And so I've had an incredible staff uh, that sort of reflect my values and more importantly, they're caring about the communities that we represent. So. You know, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy every part of it. I'm ready to move on to. So, I mean, it's just been an incredible ride. Well, that takes me to my next question. Noon, December 5th, 2016, what will come next for you, and how do you think you'll feel that day? Um, well, how do I, I, I? I'm sure it'll be an emotional day for me, you know, but particularly pulling in here for the last time. And, sure. you know, I had if I had a nickel for every time I'd gone up and down the elevator, you know, to do that for the last time and, Hopefully they'll let me have my elevator card. <laughs> but I, I, it'll probably be a very emotional piece. But, uh, I, again, one that, that I feel I'm ready for. Um, and, uh, you know, that last time out the door, we'll see. <laughs> but uh, the next day, um, it's going to feel unique. I mean, to be able to sort of I can wake up and I can do whatever I want. You can have a pajama day if you want. Yeah, I mean, I can do whatever I want. I, mean, I don't have to be at, make a speech at 7 o'clock, you know, like this morning. I had to give a speech at 7.30 in the morning and, you know, all the way into the evening. So that's going to be different, but it's going to be nice. I think um, I'm ready for the next chapter. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm talking to Pepperdine SC and Cal State Long Beach about teaching a class or being a guest lecturer. Uh, I'm talking to boards of directors. I'm talking to strategic planning groups. I'm talking to, um, you know, who knows? I mean, I just, I'm trying to find that balance. I want to work 50% and play 50% or do I want to work 70% and play 30 or do I want to play 30 and I mean 70 and work 30. So, uh, I'm trying not to overcommit too early mm -hmm. to sort of, because many folks tell me if you do that, sometimes six months down the road, you really want to do something, but you're already committed to something else. Well, you had a TV show. Now, will we be seeing you more maybe on television? Well, right now the plan is yes, um, they, that they uh, Charlie wants to continue it. Great. Uh, and so we'll continue to do that as long as uh, we do that. Um, but I've really enjoyed that. It's, it's really been interesting to bring to light the, the throes of county government and what we do every day. And mm -hmm. um, I try to tell everyone, again, I mentioned it earlier, I mean, there's a lot more to this job than just holding up a scroll and thanking somebody to being citizen of the year. And by the way, thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for this great recognition. Um, and been to many of these dinners, so it's yeah. going to be it's going to be weird being on the other side of that to be the recipient instead of MC or something like that and mispronouncing names. But uh, it, it, you know, it, um, it it's going to be different. And uh, uh, I I know that there will be somebody said, well, what are you going to miss the most? And I said, well, probably the thing I'll miss the most is being able to pick up the phone, call someone to help someone whether it's 5 o'clock on a Friday night or Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock or Sunday night at 6, uh, to being able to, to assist people. I mean, hopefully for at least a year, maybe they'll return my calls. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, I think that will continue for you. Know, you. I hope so. But, I, you know, I, that's really the, you know, I mean, that's what our job is. Nobody calls us to say thank you. Right. I mean, it's a rare call we get. They always call because they're hurting. I mean, they got some. they need something. And, mm -hmm. and with the great staff that we have, and I always tell my staff, you know, I want you to find out, you know, let's help them, number one. And number two, maybe it's a situation where what if someone doesn't know how to call a supervisor's office? How can we fix the problem, too? Right. So it's, it's uh, I mean, it, it really, I mean, this is, uh, you get a Ph.D. in life as a county supervisor, 
but more importantly, really get an opportunity to serve the people. You don't have to worry about presidential vetoes or a gubernatorial veto or a caucus telling you how to vote. Uh, you get to fix the problems. And three votes changes things. But more important is a lot of autonomy as it relates, you know, to what we have to do as a safety net. And I mean, when you come to a county hospital, the first question is not, are you Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Independent? Mm -hmm. We're sick. How do we fix it? So right. that's, that's the great thing about this job. Well, I'm sure you leave a little bit of yourself with everybody that you've met. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today.